the international media keeps telling Africans and the locals that oh, Africa is poor, Africa is poor, Africa is poor. Africa has always been a, a reservoir for resources for the rest of the world. The countries they're calling poor are oil rich, diamond rich, timber rich, and land rich, and gold rich, and they're in good locations for tourism. The people here are not stupid, they're just disconnected from global trade. That's all. The ruling elites. They are those who have monopolized political power. And they are those who are stuck in their muddy pedagogical patch. And they believe that the only way you can solve the problems in Africa is by giving the state more power and more foreign aid. And it is on the back of this hippo generation which the United Nations, the World Bank and the IMF have been trying to hitch a ride with this same old aid-driven boondoggle. And that's why we're not getting anywhere in Africa. Out of the 54 African countries, only 16 of them are democratic. Now these leaders stay in office 10, 20, 30, and even 40 years in office. And they don't even step down. They groom their sons to take over. Africans are fed up with this kind of leadership. When people support more colonialism, we had neo-colonialism, we had neo-neo-colonialism, and now we have it developed more. <laughs> Which is just another colonialism. I uh, once spent a rather happy afternoon in a place called Malibu, uh, counting the number of vehicles of different aid agencies. Theodore Dalrymple is an English physician who has worked in Tanzania, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the Gilbert Islands. He returned to the United Kingdom in 1990, where he served as a psychiatrist with prisoners in an inner city Birmingham. He is the author of numerous books, including Zanzibar to Timbuktu and Life at the Bottom. Malibu is the um, capital of Equatorial Guinea, where the first democratically elected president killed or drove into exile approximately a third of the population, and he used to keep the national treasury under his bed. When the president left the capital, they turned the electricity off as being no longer required. So I counted the number of aid agencies, and I think I counted in about three hours, I counted 27 in large white Toyotas, air conditioned, of course. And really, the devastation of Equatorial Guinea was very good business for them. The salary is uh, very good, it tends to be tax free. Unlike your life at home, you will have servants. And I think it was Schumpeter who said that one servant is worth a household full of appliances. A lot of the donor agencies, when I see the country heads driving around in the posh cars and living in the big houses, I see multiple colonial governors. This is the new face of the colonial governor. Ghanaian software entrepreneur Herman Chinere Hesse is the founder of Soft Tribe and BSL. He began in 1991 working out of his parents' home to develop a line of software especially suited for the developing world, and then began selling door to door. A leading technology pioneer, he has been called the Bill Gates of Africa and has been featured on BBC and in newspapers around the globe. He is now working to connect rural entrepreneurs to wider markets through innovative smartphone applications. I think that the World Bank and a lot of such donor organizations have an agenda outside the development of our countries. To a large extent, our governments have been held captive by the donor agencies, the international donor community, who are not, in my view, particularly interested in seeing the growth of local business, because then the tax base will represent uh, revenue. They claim that in Haiti alone, there's 10,000 NGOs. The NGOs, they do some help, but they try to find ways for them to keep giving away free stuff as if they didn't want the Haitians to stand up for themselves. Do you see what I mean? I mean, with their solar panels, solar street lights, and they are giving them for free. So what about local businessmen? So what do you expect them to do? Did you ever talk to those people who are giving it for free and say, hey, you guys Oh, we met them many times. Those NGOs, they are changing the mentality of the people. Now you have like a generation with a dependence mentality. When it becomes an industry of its own, the industry of charity, it creates more harm than good for the country. But there are different ways that can help. We have done experience with Partners Worldwide. Right? You're working in Haiti, and this is an NGO that supports businesses. So they help you set up your business. They give you training, they try to, to put you on their network, they try to sell your goods. They do everything that can help your business grow. Some NGOs also are training technicians, construction workers, mechanic guys, electricians, and they are giving them possibility to start their own business. They are teaching them how to fish, not to give them the fish every day. Your, your goal should be to give me a fishing rod and to teach me how to fish and then move out. But after 40 years, if you're still here, there's a problem. General agreements on tariffs and trade later to become the WTO, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, known as the World Bank. The goal of the World Bank was originally to help rebuild war-torn Europe, but this role was soon taken over by the Marshall Plan. In Washington, George C. Marshall made known the principles of the plan. Now, many credited the Marshall Plan as playing a key role in jumpstarting their growth. And this approach of providing foreign aid became the model for helping the developing world as well. The idea was that if you could build up infrastructure, electricity, and education, it would spark the process of economic development and countries could make the leap into industrialism. The World Bank found its new mission promoting development in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Foreign aid, or what's called official development assistance, consists of government-to-government -government transfers and can take the form of grants or loans. Tax dollars go to governments and international organizations, which transfer funds to governments in the developing world for things like food, infrastructure, and healthcare. The aid may include contingencies requiring recipient countries to implement policies that donor countries deem beneficial. 
Over time, as foreign aid has expanded, consultants, non-governmental organizations, and charities also receive aid money from governments to implement projects and will often contract with additional charities and NGOs. Catholic Relief Services receives over 70% of its budget from government money, while in 2012, World Vision received close to $175 million and the international development firm, Chemonix, more than $500 million in government contracts. A recent drive for increased foreign aid is the United Nations Millennium Development Goal. Government leaders, promoted by celebrities, and thousands of charities and universities have signed on. Foreign aid has become the cornerstone for the West's engagement with what became known as the Third World. Originally, the idea was compassionate. You saw people suffering from poverty, and therefore your immediate response is to give. But unfortunately, giving on a large scale uh, distorts. Take a country like Tanzania, where I actually worked. Its greatest receipts in foreign currency were from aid. And the whole of the political process, actually, was who got their hands on the aid. Make no mistake, I am not against humanitarian aid. Of course, if something, a disaster happens, we better rally and help each other. But when humanitarian aid becomes a way of life, then we all have a big problem. Emergency disaster relief has become the permanent model. And that model is what I call the current aid industry. I have never heard of a country that developed on aid. If, if you know of one, just let me know. I know about countries that develop on trade and innovation and business. I don't know of any country that got so much aid and they suddenly became a first world country. I've never heard of such a country. So the, the track is wrong. That track ends to nowhere. They're not encouraged to buy local. Now, when we talk to the international donor community, they say it's not their policy and that we are in, in, in cloud cuckoo land. When we talk to the government, the government says, hey, we're not allowed to buy with donor money local products. That's just the way it is. There is a school of thought out there that I don't agree with, where indeed people think they owe the poor people to give them money without thinking about how they are going to use this money. Aid leads to more aid and more aid and more aid and less independence of the people that are receiving aid. Second, there's a wrong notion for people who have money or who give aid. They feel good that they're helping, but the best way to help is to help people to be able to stand on their own. Our government actually in Tanzania, and the foreign aid amounted to a huge subsidy for a company that could not possibly have got the contract in a, in a real market. And these can amount to hundreds of millions of dollars. And the so-called foreign aid actually goes back to the people working for the company, and I suppose the shareholders of that company. It's broken. It's not working. It's not happening like it's supposed to be. Everybody's, uh, some people get very emotional about it. Everybody developing knows this is, this, this is something rotten. Not that they know. I don't have to say anything that everybody else doesn't know. What began as a plan to jumpstart economies and promote development has, over time, developed into a complex system of global humanitarianism. The system includes everything from governments and multinational corporations to aid agencies, NGOs, charities, celebrities, and social entrepreneurs. The goal is to help, but the incentives and the interplay of these different components ended up creating a global poverty industry. Perhaps the best way to understand it is through what one of the founders of sociology, French sociologist Emile Durkheim, called a social fact a broad tapestry of norms, assumptions, and social and economic institutions that transcend any one individual or organ. The social fact puts constraints on how we think and act, leading us to take many things for granted. It becomes simply the way things are done. People are always coming up with creative ideas and approaches. The trouble is that most of the innovation takes place within the assumptions, beliefs, and values of the social fact. At its core, the social fact situates the poor as the other, as objects of charity, rather than as the subjects, the active protagonists in their own story of development. People have the internal capacity to rise out of poverty, but they do so only when they have certain key things many of us take for granted, like legal protection from theft and violence, justice in the courts, the ability to get title to one's land, freedom to start and register a business, and links to wider circles of exchange. The difficulty is that this ladder to prosperity is missing in many places around the world, and the current system creates incentives for governments not to build it. Whenever you have an aid agreement, those consultants come into the country and they don't work for the country, they work for the foreign aid establishment. And so what you find is that the aid establishment severs the link between the leader of a country and his people. Because you've got all these consultants running around doing their thing, purportedly to work for the people, but in reality, their masters are in Washington and Tokyo and London and Paris. So that's what's part of what's broken with aid. Poor people have become the clients of a vast global poverty industry. If they climb out of poverty, the industry becomes obsolete. So a question we need to ask ourselves is this, who benefits the most from the way things are currently set up? The people we are trying to help are the people who work in the poverty industry. Poor people are bonsai people. Society doesn't provide them the base. The laws and the institutions and the policies do not allow them the base. So they remain stunted, and we call them poor people. Being poor has something to do with being excluded from networks of productivity and exchange. That means cell phones, internet, banks, financial systems, educational systems. I started a small company, juice processing, based in Ghana. I started to find this size of numbers of money, which family cannot get, or friends cannot get, and you have to pay those interest rates to continue your business. We're looking at about 
six to ten percent monthly. That's about seventy-two percent to one twenty percent annually of interest rate. There is no business that you can make such profits that you can pay off your loan with such interest. That one is cheaper. Can I put up in Ghana? We have small scale, small microfinancing companies that tend to lend out to market women, small shops, that microfinancing companies. We have a lot of them in the system. Then we have the big banks who tend to lend out to big companies. So there's a gap. There's a gap between the small and the large scale uh, big companies. But in between them, we don't have those who want to lend out to the SMEs. They put all the figures around that SMEs come for long. You go there, they don't give it to you. The process is so long. Plus, you definitely are not going to get it for someone like who doesn't have a landing property, who doesn't have a, a land or a house. So growing is virtually difficult. You are expensive. If you look at the distribution in prosperous countries, you see that most companies are small and medium sized. If you look at that same distribution in emerging markets, in poor countries, you see that there's a lot of very small companies and a few very large companies and nobody in the middle. This is called the missing middle. And that is so important because that middle is what creates prosperity. It's not that people don't have the capacity to be much uh, more efficient, it's that the access is not democratized. One of the key factors that creates inclusion and fairness for the poor is justice in the courts, or what is often referred to by development economists as the rule of law. Rule of law is that I know what I am, what is the rights and responsibilities around me, and it's protected. That's the rule of law. Otherwise, it's a jungle. The most powerful one will take everything. And that's not a good uh, idea for human society. What I said was, you Americans, butt out, we don't need your foreign aid, we can feed ourselves, and they would list these wonderful uh, perennial nut-bearing trees and things that had now been cut down because of cheap Western dumping foreign aid into those cultures, which depressed the price of their locally produced food, and here we are poor, and we're not feeding ourselves, not because we can't, but because of uh, this, this Western dumping. Self-sufficient on rice. Try and imagine a football match without rules. But you don't get a game going. The rules are crucial to get that game going. But everybody knows how to drive a ball. Everybody knows how to buy and sell. So there's plenty of entrepreneurship in the, in the world. The problem are the rules. In two-thirds of the world, there isn't yet the rule of law. What makes people interested in the rule of law, the first thing that they understand is that everybody having clean titles in Ghana is very, very difficult. You buy land, you have to buy four or five times. If you're looking for farmland as a small peasant farmer, you're looking for five acres to buy. You can get five acres from the chief by giving him a drink. But you don't own the five acres. So you can't go to the bank with the five acres as your uh, collateral to, to then borrow money to buy a tractor. Uh, last time I had a meeting at the World Bank, I, I asked uh, the World Bank officials, like, hey, you've been working with our government all these years. You know this is at the bottom of our, our problems. What are you doing about it? Are you saying for 20 years you just forgot that uh, we have a situation where anybody's business, anybody's house can suddenly come into question and uh, they might just lose their investment and, and that it, it wouldn't encourage people to invest? I don't see that a lot of work has been done there or a lot of progress has been made there. You can't start an economy without ownership not being in question. This is my fundamental. The lack of property rights is just one area where the rule of law is missing. The poor lack access to justice in the courts and are often locked out of the formal economy by complex legal structures that only the rich and well-connected can navigate. When I use the term rule of law, I do not want for people to think that I'm saying we don't have enough laws. Most of uh, countries in Africa don't provide good rule of law. On one hand, they are completely excluded from these systems of uh, productivity, and on the other hand, they are basically choking under the heaviness of these corrupt leaders of theirs who have put together the worst laws possible to allow them to try and make it through. Friendly for some of us and could be the enemy for the majority. And we've actually have research that shows that, that within each country, there's a big range in which things can happen extremely fast and efficient in developing countries. If you know the minister, if you have connections, and if you don't, you're on the other end. So it's a very partisan system, a system which is limited to very privileged people. You are stuck in a hole, in a village with all your skills. You have to sink or swim ourselves.